This is the eLearn Podcast. If you're passionate about the future of learning, you're in the right place. The expert guests on this show provide insights into the latest strategies, practices, and technologies for creating killer online learning outcomes. My name is Ladek, and I'm your host from OpenLMS. The eLearn Podcast is sponsored by eLearn Magazine, your go-to resource for all things online learning click-by-click how-to articles, the latest in edtech, a spotlight on successful outcomes and trends in the marketplace. Subscribe today and never miss a post at elearnmagazine.com. And OpenLMS, a company leveraging open source software to deliver a highly effective, customized, and engaging learning experience for schools, universities, companies, and governments around the world since 2005. Learn more at openlms.net. Hi there, I'm Laddick. This episode is part of a live real-time series that I recorded at the 2022 EduCost Conference in Denver, Colorado. In this conversation, I speak with Daniel Rourke about esports and how games, not just gamification, are already a huge part of the future of education. And just a quick reminder, you can make sure to never miss an episode of the podcast by subscribing at elearnmagazine.com. Now, I give you Daniel Rourke. Okay, once again, we are back here at Educause. Um, it's the lunch hour. And I can't thank you enough for coming by to you know speak with me. Is it, is it Rourke? Is that the Okay, so yeah. Daniel Rourke, and you were with Dell. Dell Technologies, yeah. I'm a senior yes. higher education strategist. So I, I had T Mobile on just a second ago, okay. and we were talking about digital inclusive. Excellent. So they've got awesome data on you know what you know, the BYOD model and these kinds of Fantastic. You want to talk about learning spaces and the evolution of the learning space. You know, the thing that I love, you, you did like a gaming thing here, didn't mm-hmm. you? Uh, yeah, we just had an esports tournament with e-sports local Colorado tournament. college students. Tell so. me, how important is esports? I just need to, like, I, I still try to explain it to my wife. <laughs> I know that, but this is billions of dollars now. It is, it is. It is um, almost a $2 billion industry at this point. Um, so it, it is incredibly important. I will 100% admit I am biased. So want to be transparent out there. Um, I've, I've been a gamer geek since I was a little girl and, and definitely wish I had these opportunities. Uh, but it is incredibly important in my opinion because of the community it allows the students. And it also provides them with voice and choice in how they're learning, what they're learning, what they want to go on to do as a career. And esports can give them so many amazing global competencies, professional competencies, experiential learning. If, if you see what it takes to set up an esports tournament, you know those students are working logistics, problem solving, critical thinking, all of those things. Now, uh, for a parent, I'm, I'm a parent of, you know, I don't have a college age student yet, but soon I'm biased as well. But let's let's talk to them for a second. And in the institutions around here, like a lot of people see Fortnite, a lot of people see, you know, some of the, the violent games and scheduled things, but also some of them see Minecraft and whatnot. The esports universe, what does it consist of? What are the most popular things out there? I know that we won't talk about learning spaces. Yeah, no worries. But how are they, like, how are we having that conversation and who's having the aha moment around, yes, we want to invest in this, mm-hmm. or is the industry just going to take care of itself? And higher ed hasn't really paid attention. I would definitely say the former. It okay. is there are so many schools out there that are starting to pay attention to it. They're seeing the results from other schools in their area. They're seeing news stories. They're seeing articles. They're seeing videos. They're seeing events like Educause and yeah. things that we're doing here. And they're seeing the engagement. They're seeing people crowd around the booth. Um, and you know these are these are uh, not necessarily students anymore. These are professional adults that are very possibly far along in yeah. their career that are understanding and that are starting to see it. You know, I would say probably five to ten years ago, it was more of a why would we ever want to put video games in school? But now they're starting to see like, okay, there's an incredible amount of benefit as far as community building for the students. Many of the students that belong in esports programs never really found their niche on campus anywhere. So this gives them a place of belonging, a place where they can feel like, okay, yeah, these people are are my people and we can get along and and learn and do things together. Um, But above that, I actually, I need to trademark this. I kind of call it my esports engagement pyramid where the above that, (laughs) <laughs> For everyone out there, this is this is this is IP right here. Do not steal this. <laughs> um, but on top of that, community building, which if that's where the school stays, it's great. 
But um, on top of that, you have the academic and the curriculum and the helping students along on career pathways, like streaming, yeah. like shoutcasting, like doing the AV setup for events. Um, those are all things that schools can invest in and that the schools themselves can also benefit from by offering new programs. And then there's even like the little top pyramid of research. There's strong right. academic research going on. So that is, you know, all of those things combined together are just a powerhouse for schools and communities and students to be able to partner together and really develop a greater understanding, a greater offering. And it does tie back to learning spaces because then truly you've got a video game arena or a space and that's a learning space for I students. I, I, I'm the only word that's going through my head right now is stickiness. Yes. Right? It's, it's yeah. how do I keep my students on campus? Holy smokes. You know, or how do I, even if we think of campus as a virtual engaged universe yeah. like i'm like this is something that they're attaching themselves to especially if there's something that they're really enjoying i mean we all know the classic gamer mom you know persona is somebody who's like in a cave for you know days at a time and whatever so like a stickiness for a university is in, 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 in especially if you can put it into an education phrase huge yes? yes yeah it's absolutely huge um, we were just talking with one of the students over in the dell booth about you know, kind of interviewing him and saying like, yeah, I've, I've been with this group for four to five years because I believe in it and I see the benefit that it gives to my other students and peers. Um, and so it is, it is just a wonderful tool for engagement that more universities should definitely be paying attention to. Um, and we're here to help. So tie this to act like the evolution of learning spaces. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could sit here and riff about gaming for us, I think. We but <laughs> <laughs> Which maybe we should. I don't know. Maybe. We should. But what? So what else have you talked about? What other? You said you had posters. You've had another other presentations as well. Yeah. What were those about? Like like talking about learning spaces in, in general. Absolutely. Well, our panel is coming up literally right after this. Oh, so okay, great. Very okay, I thought maybe it already uh -huh. on on this podcast. So, um, but yeah, it is. We're going to be focusing on the evolution of higher education learning spaces because it's no longer sage on the stage. It's no longer just sitting in the back of the classroom and pretending not to sleep while someone lectures at you for two hours, um, students are demanding more. And especially the students that are in school now that are getting ready to enter the higher ed uh, space, they have been digital natives. And I know that that term is overused, but they truly have grown up with technology at their fingertips and more interactive ways of coming together and experiencing things. So we need to make sure that the classrooms adapt to that. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that the classrooms are engaging and are mobile and have elements where you can participate in either uh, a face-to-face -face model, a hybrid model, or even a high-flex model where sometimes you're having remote students, maybe even a remote instructor, participating at the same time as in-person students and still being able to enable that learning to happen efficiently and effectively. I, so the question I just asked our my previous guest, um, and it's, I, I'm finding that this is becoming really important to me because I know it's a different, it, it's, it's, I guess it's a total personal, you know, what's that called, sample of, uh, of convenience kind of okay. question. Yeah. How, when, as, as these learning spaces are evolving, and as you, you just put all kinds of different scenarios on the table, what what are the strategies that you found or are finding to to create belonging and to create feeling like one of the huge things about going to a school you choose it because you're like you love the brand or you love the campus or you love what it means and, and but the parents went there oh, 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 oh. <laughs> we're not about legacy students here today, but no no um do, do, I, I guess do you see where I'm going with this question of if it's all if it's remote or if I can kind of participate from anywhere how do I what are the elements of making me feel like I'm a part of it? Absolutely. Well, and you know, with with the pandemic, we really saw this emergence of the high flex label. And so a lot of people actually said we actually do have a presentation about that, but the difference between just kind of traditional hybrid learning and high flex learning and um, you know, for such a long time, hybrid learning has been around, but it's been a case of okay, if you're there in, yeah, if you're there in person. Great, you get all of the synchronous content and all of that interaction, but if you're not there in person, then you just have to watch the recording and you know do that. So I think the challenge for technologists, especially in the higher education space now, is to challenge those old status quo and to say, no, we need to create these more collaborative spaces where students can face each other, where they can interact, they can do uh, group work, they can do single work. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about David Thornburg's research with the, the campfires, the caves, and the I don't, watering I don't holes. know this. They, oh, no, this is... Go check it out. Okay. <laughs> David Thornburg, campfires, caves, and watering holes. But the fact that 
many different students, you know, just like we all have different communication styles, students have different learning styles. And so not only does a particular student have a different learning style, but they may have different learning needs for their environment mm. at different times. So, um, for example, you know, a, a campfire where you're gathered together in a small intimate group, maybe that's for project work, maybe that's for um, learning together or studying a very hard, difficult concept to understand. Um, and then you have, you know, things like the caves, where that's your, your private space where you are very um, kind of by yourself and you're able to be immersed Deep in the content. Yeah, exactly. yes. yeah. and, and so not only can you have students that need those very different spaces, but the same student at different times. So making those available on campus is critical. So take me to, and again, I've said this on a number of conversations, we tend to divide the learning universe into like K-12, higher ed, and then four, right? Like how is this, do you get to look at all of those spaces as well and has, the flexible, the high flex, the gaming, has that bled into, okay, I'm not in higher ed anymore, and, but you know, I want to bring that into my work environment. And I'll, I'll put a sub question there, because I saw the pushback from, or I've seen the pushback from like the Google campus and the Facebook campus, where it's like, I don't necessarily want to live at work. Right. Like, talk to me about that. Absolutely. Well, and I think, I think truly, Hopefully I'll answer your question, but my opinion There's on that... There's everyone you want to answer, <laughs> and there was like five in there, I don't know. There, there were a couple, but, you know, the way that I feel and, and truly like the way that, that Dell feels is that it needs to be collaborative. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are many challenges that higher education may not be able to face themselves. And, and we've seen that um, higher education institutions cannot necessarily tackle themselves, but industry partnerships go a long way in that. So making sure that you have good partners that you believe in, that believe in you, that you're operating under the same mission goals of educating and making the world a better place, that is so critical to have those partnerships because then the industry can provide business cases, the industry can provide internships, the industry can provide their own training. Like at Dell, we actually have Student Tech Crew, which is a program where students can get certified on Dell products, Dell services, and they can not only help their current institution that they are attending, but that they can take those skills into the workplace. And it benefits us as well because then more people know how to work on our products. So it's a truly collaborative partnership that really helps amplify the fact that high ed and industry do need to be working together and it's not an either or thing. Awesome. Fantastic. What is, what's next for learning spaces in your in your mind? Like one of the questions I was asking Lisa Stevens and Rebecca Crazy, is that right? I, I guess, that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I asked the mystery is you know, a lot of campuses have oh, the buildings are already built, the architecture is already there. How are how are we evolving the spaces that we already have mm -hmm. to make them more computer learning inclusive, learning friendly, yeah. uh, adapting to active learning models, these kinds of things. Is is you know is there a process, a method, a thing like can you turn any room into a new a new learning environment, that kind of stuff? I am a firm believer that you can. Okay. And speaking of Lisa Stevens yeah. and Rebecca, um, the the flex space. Uh, all of those resources to be able to say, okay, how did other schools do it? What were they doing that was successful? What worked, what didn't, what trials and tribulations did they go through? Learning together has been something that higher ed has been exemplary at sure. for years. Mm -hmm. That is something that needs to continue as we get into this evolution of learning spaces. Working together, finding out what helps. Um, we actually Dell did a case study with Montana State University at Billings where they were actually um, changing up their classrooms, adding more touch screens, adding more audio video um, ability, just in different ways, so that there were these capabilities for the students, whether they were remote, whether they were on campus, um, you know, whether they were commuting in a bus or a train or something like that, that they could still interact with the course and still hear everything, see everything on the board, and have those opportunities for learning. So um, yeah, definitely Google, Dell Technologies, Montana State University buildings, <laughs> and take a look at that use case because there were some great examples of how they brought in technology to actually update their learning spaces and um, you know start rolling that out to more spaces on campus. Talk to me about what you're most excited about in the near term future. Like, where does your research go? Where does your program go? I mean, you get this massive, super super cool mesh of 
the gaming space plus the, you know learning space. Plus, like, where where are you going? Like, what are you excited about for the next six you know, six eighteen months? Oh, I'm so excited about so many things. So I'm gonna try to narrow it down. Um, one thing too. <laughs> I don't care. That's great. <laughs> okay, fine, fine. Um, so one of the things that we are doing actually, if you. Again, Google UT Austin Gaming Lounge um, with Alienware. By the way, can you just say how pissed I am that I'm old? <laughs> I know. Where was this like, when we were going to school? Like seriously, like yeah. Yeah, I, I have that conversation all the time. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, so this gaming lounge is amazing, and it it is something they took a very small space, like 700 square feet on campus, that really wasn't being utilized incredibly well. It was just kind of a flowover space place for students to drop things, eat, do whatever. Um, we were able to partner with them and with some of our design partners and create this incredibly engaging gaming lounge where it's not only for their esports team, which is a great esports team, by the way, um, but what do they it, play? Uh, everything, League of Legends, Overwatch, etc. Um, so not only that, but they are also making sure that all of the students on the UT Austin campus can come in, experience it. I've heard that there have been some days where there are like students looking through the glass, I'm going, sure, what are they doing? Sure, yeah. So any time that you can create flavor that esports arenas, gaming lounges, etc., are active learning spaces. 100%. That they they can be transformed. They can not only help do experiential learning, they can help do research, they can help um, in so many ways, and you can multi-purpose may, 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 The Please. One of the things that was a huge aha moment for me, I, I can't remember who I was talking to about this, but if you think about the level of effort that a gaming company puts into making sure that someone who first downloads a game stays with the game, mm -hmm. that is all learning, right? So it's, it's how do you introduce the character? How do you introduce the, the avatar? How do you introduce the different modalities of playing the game of like and leveling up from there what could we learn just from these institutions that have figured out again that stickiness of here's how i get started here's how i stay and then you're hooked right mm -hmm. imagine we do that with so, so, so many other uh you know, types of education right it would be intensive so. yeah absolutely um well and one of the things we're starting to see more and more of the gaming publishers recognize that okay, we need to pay attention to education, not only from the facet that you were talking about, but also in how do we reach out to the educational institutions and get stickier and make sure that they know the different types of products and offerings we have. Epic is a great example of that yeah, with yeah, Unreal Engine Unreal and Twin Engine. Motion. Mm -hmm. So regardless of whether you want to be in advertising or architecture, um, you know, design or gaming, there is something there that Epic is offering to anybody who is learning, and you know they are offering some of their coursework for free on Unreal Engine. So you don't even necessarily have to be in educational institutions. You can do it on your own for free, which again goes back to um, which again goes back to that industry and educational partnership. It's so critical to make sure that you're providing those resources to give the best experience to students. Fantastic. Can't think enough of this conversation. It sounds like they want us to stop. No, yeah, I know it's, it's much harder. <laughs> but this is where we're going to Daniel Rourke, Dell Technologies. Can people reach out to you? Like research or anything like that? How do you do that? Absolutely. So um, my email is danielle.rourke at dell.com. So fairly easy. I'm also on Twitter. It's at hi ed danielle, but it's H I E D Danielle. Um, and then I'm also on LinkedIn. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Thanks again for joining me for the eLearn podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. Just, just push subscribe on your player right now. And remember, you can join the conversation live on YouTube, Facebook, and my LinkedIn feed every week. I hope to see you there. Thanks.